Welcome to episode 160 of the CU Insight Experience. I'm Randy Smith, one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and this show is all about taking a deep dive with the leaders of the credit union movement that make it so great. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Q's, the credit union industry's leading talent development solutions provider. After listening to this show today, learn more and register for CEO Dialogue by visiting Q's.org to join your fellow CEOs in an open Open discussion tackling the industry's most pressing issues. Sounds like a pretty cool thing. Today, I get to have a conversation with Linda Bodie and Zach Christensen. Uh, Zach is the executive director of CU Pride and Linda, the CEO of Element Federal Credit Union. They are both co-founders of CU Pride along with Brandy Stankovich and Sue Mitchell. And I hope to have Brandy on the show soon. Sue has been on the show before, so we'll link to those as well. But this is a conversation I was really looking forward to the two friends of mine that I, I, I know this is going to be a great episode. So anyways, enough from me. Let's jump right in. Linda, Zach, welcome to the show, my friends. Well, I mean, I think I mentioned it in my email. There's there's maybe a slight sense of imposter syndrome here, but uh, thankfully, I've got my my best friend Linda here to lift me up and and support me along the way. No need for that syndrome, my friend. That's for <laughs> sure. Lin- Linda, welcome back. It's great to be here, Randy. Thanks for asking me to come back. Oh, um, of course. I guess that's a good good sign, right? Yeah, it is absolutely. I, I absolutely love talking to you. So this is going to to be a lot of fun. I like to start the show off with just for the people that don't know you yet to for both of you just to to give us a little backstory. You know, who are you and how'd you how'd you get to credit unions and where you are in credit unions? Most of us didn't, you know, wake up being like as kids being like I want to work in credit unions someday. So to quote your Herb Wagner speech and your CU Insight article, who is Linda Bodie? Let's start with you. <laughs> well, I won't recite that again. Right, but, can, we, we can link uh, to that. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Linda Bodie, and I am the CEO of Element Federal Credit Union in Charleston, West Virginia. That has not always been my title, but I started out in West Virginia, growing up here, living here my entire life. Went to school, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Took accounting, like, well, I'll get a degree in accounting, and did some accounting stuff for a while, and then I accidentally got into a credit union. <laughs> <He> stumbled in. <laughs> and here I am. Oh, well, so, we're, we're glad we found you. Yeah. Zach, how about you? So my credit union story is a really interesting, but around 19, I was working at Bank of America. Quickly found out that uh, I did not enjoy the culture there. I was a, a merchant teller, though. So I had lots of contacts and lots of offers from businesses saying, if you ever want to leave, come see me. Well, I made the mistake of leaving Bank of America and going to a payday lender. I know. I know. So You're just um, checking all the boxes. Here. I know. <laughs> and then um, my longtime dear friend, Brandy Stankovic, found out. And said, no, 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 you need to come, come and work with me. And so back then that was with Midas and that was Sue Mitchell's uh, uh, initial credit union entrepreneurship role. And so I came over and started working with the mystery shop team and got to know credit unions very well. By the time uh, I left there, we were, you know, working with about 200 credit unions and 600 mystery shoppers and, and just doing some really great stuff. And then I decided to take a sabbatical for about 15 years. And during that time, I worked in retail. I did uh, consumer packaged goods. I did a little bit of everything. And I had been laid off and I was in Arizona at the time. And Brandy again called me and said, hey, I've got this thing called the Strategic Hot Box, uh, her podcast. She says, it's kind of getting bigger than I expected. Would you be interested in helping me out part time? I said, sure. Do it virtually. Well, it started getting more, you know, a little more insane. And she made the offer. Why don't you just move back to Vegas? Come back to Vegas. Come work for me part, part full time. And then all of a sudden things happened. She went to CUSG and I found myself working with Sue again. So it was this big full circle moment coming back to credit unions. And I never in a million years would have, have uh, none of this was on my bingo card, my career bingo card. 
I think that's how we met the first time was virtually when it was like I was on Brandy's podcast. Yeah, actually, it was at the Underground in New York City with uh, colliding with Think, that's um, right. and yeah. and you were there. And I just I remembered you because you're just very personable, very exciting person. And so I, I really enjoyed you. But now now I'm I'm with Mitchell Sankovic and Associates, director of marketing and clients there, also a advocate for the Underground community, and now executive director of CU Pride. So. It's, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead a few questions that I had written down, but let's just get right into CU Pride. You two, along with Brandy, are the founders of CU Pride. I guess talk to everybody out there, right? Like about what was your motivation behind it to me, just again, like as somebody who seems to like kind of watches credit unions at that blimp level, it, it seems like there's a lot of momentum recently. Like it went from a small group, you know, a smaller group on Facebook and things like that to I mean, this GAC seemed wonderful, right? Like, uh, so <laughs> give me a little, I guess, a little background on the motivation, how it came about, and even the goals for it. If you guys want to break that up, I won't, I'll stop talking. <laughs> I'll let Linda kick it off because I was, I was brought in as the conversation was happening. So, Linda. Yeah. So, over the years, my life in the credit union industry, I was a lesbian long before I joined credit unions, <laughs> might as well say from birth. Um, so, when I got in the industry, well, just like anything else, people weren't talking about it. People weren't out about it. So year after year, not hearing anything in conferences or in meetings, not seeing anybody visible. I finally just started saying things cryptically at first and then going on stage at Sea Water Cooler event and just that. broadcasting it to see, is anybody out there? If you are, sure enough, they were. So then a couple of years later, I did an underground conference and spoke again. And we talked about visibility and Zach and Brandy and Sue. We all got together and just said, let's start this thing. Let's start a group of something to advocate for the LGBTQ persons in credit unions and to make people feel comfortable, to feel visible and to talk about it and for it to be okay in their workplace, in their memberships and in their community. You know, Zach, we were talking before we hit record and that idea of, I mean, you saying now that, you know, you're the executive director now. So the amount of people that are reaching out to you, right? Just as a community sense, very upper, underrepresented as Linda was just talking about. Can, can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I think it was, you know, just like Linda said, the, the initial meetup that we had in 2020 at JAC before the pandemic, 37 people were there and it was everything from board level to frontline staff you know, business partners, QSOs. So we ran the gamut, which was fantastic. And and that was the exciting part. And now as as we've grown and and received visibility, and I have to say probably the the moment that it really hit me was GAC last year, 2022, walking into the convention center and just seeing people be 100% authentically themselves, seeing rainbow pin. It, it just was this next level where, oh my gosh, this this thing that the, Linda said at the underground was, my gaydar doesn't go off enough uh, while I'm at these credit union events and I don't understand why. And we didn't have to have one because everybody was just there and felt good and felt open. And so it now has turned into this place where I I get to hear a lot of stories and I hear stories from those in the community. I hear stories from the allies and why they support it and why they're there and why they're, they're a part of the conversation. And the best part about CU Pride is there are no labels required. So anybody who participates and is a part of it, we just want you to take part in the conversation, bring it home, bring it back to your organizations and, and share it. We, we don't need you to, to come in and say, my name is Zach and I am a gay man. And, you know, therefore, you know, I get membership and see you pride. That's that's not what we do. Um, and and the stories are just they're amazing. Some are heartbreaking, but but they all just kind of pull together the whole mission of this where. We want the industry to embrace the community. We want to be a full-fledged industry that we can go to the community and say, hey, this is the place to work. If you want to work somewhere where they believe in you, they want you to be your your 100% authentic self, that's what we want credit units to be. And so that's kind of what we're working towards right now. I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a long way to this question, but it was something that I was thinking about. And then also one of these things where that that kind of you don't know until 
so you know type of a thing. Like I, I never was, I guess, maybe faced with it or around something like this as a middle-aged white dude, right? But when last fall, when I was in Africa, there were folks with us on the the Kilimanjaro climb team, that, that type of stuff, you know, a, a married couple that had to pretend they were sisters because it's still illegal in countries. And I was just reading an article about uh, that one of the countries in Africa that just made it illegal again, that it hadn't been or something. It got me, I mean, that obviously, that's something, and you sit here, at least for me, right? Like trying to be too positive maybe sometimes or whatever. It's like, okay, well, but we're better than that. But then you see, although like it, it feels to me again, like, laws and like are trying to be walked back in much of the country as credit unions as being you know the place hopefully that all are welcome (laughs) you know like what should credit unions be doing from whether it's individual credit unions the individuals who are in it or the system as a whole to promote and you know the inclusivity across our country yeah we do this every day we we are either attacked threatened to be attacked by laws, by whatever craziness out there. And we've taken the stance as our credit union and and people as individuals to band together with like-minded businesses and organizations and even our city. I mean, we're fighting this and being who we are, you know, outside of those idiotic laws and things that are trying to keep us hidden and not visible and not participating in society. So we're basically just doing our own thing and keeping the visibility there regardless, no matter what you hear, no matter what they say, no matter what laws are passed, you are worthwhile. You are loved and we are going to be there for you. We're going to have the rainbow stickers on our door telling you you're welcome. We're going to be at the ballpark every year with our pride at the ballpark. We're going to be marching in the streets during pride month. So being out and visible and supporting regardless of the laws, that's what you do. Get with your community and make a plan and make it happen. Yeah, I don't have much to add on that except for if you really, truly look at Linda and the credit union, the term poster child truly is there. And and I think that that's from a credit union standpoint, first and foremost, ensure that your employees feel safe and are welcome within the the credit union. And then you've got to take it to the community and show your employees and then to your members that you're inclusive and you're welcoming and you want to support. And so no matter what's happening on the outside world, we have influence in, in the places where we can make change. And with credit unions, that's where they can make change. They are tied to their communities. And if they're not tied to the LGBTQ+, that's okay. There's no better time than now. And no one's going to be mad at you for not doing it earlier. But just make the efforts, take the steps, get out there and and showcase. More than just the the sticker on the door. And the sticker is great. Any sort of visibility. Um, but you also got to you gotta walk the walk. And, and you got to be there um, and, and, you know, walk out onto that ballpark and, and show, you know, these kids. Linda's got a great story about a kid who got to see the, the Pride Festival for the first time and, and what it meant to her and her mother. And so, so that's where, where it really starts is, is start with your internal, make sure that that is set and then step into your community because that's where you're at. Two part question here to talk about CU Pride. Is there a struggle that you, you all are facing? today (laughs) that you're like, we need to bust through that. And if we were to look out, I mean, that break out the proverbial crystal ball, right? Like, what's the goal? What's the hope that CU Pride looks like two years from now, five years from now? You now have an executive director, right? (laughs) So I mean, that's a, I'll be honest, I I think in our space, I am a huge Renee fan over at ACUC. (laughs) The organization that she's been able to build in a fairly short period of time, it was always there. We were all at the, the Pride and the ACUC event at GAC. That's a much bigger than event than just a little room at the, you know, in the convention center or something like that, right? What's the hope for CU Pride? Yeah, the, I guess the, the issue, the big issue is we want to do so much so quickly, so fast. We just want it done. I mean, it's never going to be done. All right. But yeah. Thankfully, Zach is the executive director now, so you, we can point the finger at him, right? right. <laughs> just make a whole list. <laughs> Let's get this done. But you're right. It was kind of it was kind of effortless to form it because everybody was there. We said to find them. So now it's developing this 
organization that will do XYZ trying to find out what XYZ is. And that depends a lot on um, our partner organizations that are supporting us as well as the credit unions and involvement there. And what are the needs? Because the, the needs are all over the place. So we're developing those resources um, to make sure that we are giving credit unions and partners what they need and also trying to be visible and included in conferences and events. That's huge because that's more exposure to us. So the fact that we've been at GAC doing DEI Tuesday, um, that has been just huge for us. And we've, we've done some other events as well. So I'm hoping to do more of that, more exposure, more volunteers, maybe get Zach a helper <laughs> or two. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I, Linda nailed it on the head. You know, the struggles were were more so how quickly it grew and going, okay, how do we lasso all of this in, bring it together and make sure that we're on a track that, that really goes. And, and it's, you know, for any organization, you just have to focus on the mission. You have to know what the end goal is. And as I mentioned, it's about getting the industry to embrace us. So, so initially right now, we're, we're really working on that, helping credit unions find their way in their DEI work on what inclusion for the LGBTQ plus looks like and and how to implement that. I would say probably the next two steps are helping credit unions in terms of uh, products and services and what that looks like. Once again, I, I look to Linda here, you know, Linda has been providing quote unquote LGBTQ plus services, but they're not anything different than what credit unions do now. You know, it's about uh, utilizing uh, home equity loans to help gay couples adopt or or using signature loans for healthcare. There there are ways and it's just about sharing those stories and understanding. And then once we get there, then it's going to be about helping credit union showcase to the members and their communities what inclusion looks like. Because could you imagine if we were an entire financial services sector that was supported by this entire community and what that would do for for credit unions? You want to talk about market share and spending power, just having the LGBTQ plus buy into credit unions. Plus you have the allies who are watching credit unions do the work. I mean, to me, that's a, that's a home run right there. To scratch my own itch questions, I'm going down rabbit holes now. Linda, when you were talking, one of the things that just popped into my head is uh, when Teresa Freeborn was on the show recently talking about her book, one of the things that she talked about was like, she became a CEO and thought, okay, look, women can all become CEOs. You're a CEO also, right? Like, um, But that doesn't mean that it's the as easy of path. When you think about CU Pride, that representation around the, the in the C-suite. Right. Like the, the representation as the CEO. I, I, I mean, I, I, it's kind of one of these, like the question that Zach and I were talking a little bit before we, we hit re- record about it. Like if you were to have a CEO conference, CEO pride conference, how big of a room would that be? How do we make sure that like from a career standpoint that the opportunities are there as well? Yeah, and that's a really complicated question. Thanks for that one. Um, and you're right; it'd be uh, there might be ten people in that conference right now. I don't know. There there could be more, and it it all depends on who's comfortable being out as well. Um, so you have some people who are out, and it's it's not a big deal, and you have some people who are not out because they can't be. So I think we're always going to have kind of that squishiness. Now, would would the people who are not out attend? Will they ever feel comfortable being out? Maybe as time continues to move forward and the younger people move up, I don't think they're going to have any tolerance for hiding themselves. So they'll either not be in the industry or they'll just be out and proud. And eventually this will evolve into, oh, okay, we have we have this critical mass now. We can do these events uh, or have more open CEOs or C-suite people. And it's kind of, oh, it's normal now. So I just, I think we need more time and more growth for that to happen. Uh, Jill and I were just having a conversation a couple of days ago and she had one of Crosby, her son's 11 and one of his friends was over and they were talking about someone who they went to grade school with now identifies as a, a girl. And it was like, just so cool. That's normal. That's whatever. But it was so cool to see because I, 
again, think back to like if when I was in middle school, you know, that just wasn't the case. So it, it, it's hopefully that that it's that changes that that idea of the, the acceptance and being able to be your your whole self, right? Like is making steps every day, I guess, is, is my thing. Zach, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, I. I think uh, the only thing I would say is that to to remember that uh, from a diversity standpoint, this community it's it's an invisible di- diversity. It's not something you can you can make assumptions, you can use your own bias to try to to figure out the world, but you don't know until someone tells you. Period. And so, so the first thing I'm going to say is that that room of CEOs is going to be bigger because we don't have labels. So we would have a ton of CEOs there. But if we're, if we're talking about those who are in the community and, and facing some of the hardships that, that the community faces, yes, I would agree with, with Linda. The continuing to build this and, and showcase that all credit unions and leadership across the board, we're going to see that increase and we're going to see more people feel comfortable to be out. And I would venture to guess that we have more that are in the C-suite and in CEOs than we know. And we don't need to know until they're ready to tell us. So what, what we do need to do is just ensure that we're continuing to create the space for them to be to come out if and when they're ever ready. Let me ask the ally question. What should allies be doing? <laughs> I love that. I'm just going to throw it right out there. I'll let you guys talk about this. No more than I do. So. <laughs> Well, they should be supporting, period, and advocating and calling out any issues when they happen, any people saying things that are not accurate or friendly, standing up for those that need a little support and just being there to to fight with us or whatever their gift is, do it. All of the allies are just like everybody else. They have special gifts. What is that gift? Maybe they want to march in the parades. Maybe they want to write articles. Maybe they want to do presentations, whatever. Just be there and tell tell that person and tell the people that you're there for them no matter what. I think, uh, you know, in the words of Brandy, and that's why Brandy's an integral part of, of CU Pride, because we, we wouldn't have this group without having the allies with us. And we can't make change without them either. So Brandy, Brandy's thing is that, that as allies, we have... They have to fight the front lines with us. They have to be shoulder to shoulder. And in a lot of cases, like Linda says, you use your platform to lift them up. If your voice is is heard above others, then you give the person next to you the, the microphone and stand beside them so people are hearing. And it, it's about taking integral steps. And sometimes those steps are small. And, you know, sometimes progress feels like it's taking forever. But the moment that you have somebody visibly show and stand up as an ally, then you know that they're taking the first step and they're they're doing the right thing. And then they can learn. And that's that's we we are here. That's what CU Pride is here to do is to help them learn. Because not every individual has the capability to sit down and tell somebody their whole story and what they should do and here are the steps. So that's why I see this organization and why in addition to focusing on the LGBTQ plus, we have a very, very strong focus on building allies and what allyship means and how to how to increase that. So we never lose focus because the allies are are learning with us as well. Was there anything you hoped before we move on to some leadership questions and have a little fun with the rapid fire questions and things like that? Was there anything that you hoped that I was going to ask you about CU Pride that you want to get out into the world that I didn't? (laughs) Linda? I'm not aware of anything, but we didn't talk about drag queens. So, you know, (laughs) I'm not sure what we would talk about, but they're super popular right now. As they always have been. That is a fascinating thing. The the fear that seems to bring out in so much of the country. Yeah, I, I would just say if you haven't been to a drag show, go. <laughs> it's one of the most amazing art forms that I've ever experienced in my life. And so I would say the only other thing to add, uh, Randy, is that at DEI Tuesday at GAC this year, uh, CU Pride announced official membership to become a formal association, and that's open now. So any organization, you can be as an uh, individual, but we're really focused on bringing the organizations in. Organizations shine up as a, a member, and that gives access to their entire employee base to be a part of it, join it, have have the conversation. So we're really trying to not restrict and and give the opportunities while we're building a sustainable organization into the future. 
uh, we will link to that for sure in the uh, the show notes. So it, it's uh, any information y'all want included in there, send them over to me and we'll link everywhere. So <laughs> now uh, a few leadership questions and, and these have changed a little bit, Linda, since you were on the show. So I get to ask you both. But one that I wanted to start with was we're all kind of in that same, let's call it age range, it seems like, you know, many of those like leadership books, and maybe what we were taught growing up to me don't seem like they've aged very well. And I'll ask both of you this, like, what to you, what what makes a good leader, a good CEO today? Yeah, that's a good question. Because it, it depends on your personality. I mean, a lot of people try and you're talking about the books, try and be that thing in that book instead of being themselves and using their special skills and passions, everybody's got their own way of doing things. So I think once you, you really need to, to do some self evaluation, learn who you are and determine how you're good. What, what exactly are you good at doing? Because I tried to follow those books <laughs> and I was lost. So <laughs> when I started being myself, learning what my strengths were, weaknesses were, and, and learning about other people and their personalities, then it became easier for me to relate, to use my skills to better lead, get people to understand the communication is key, um, relating to one another. So I think just finding that thing that you're good at and the way that you can inspire others, it's there's a secret sauce for you. The books will help, but learn about yourself and learn the ways that you can inspire others to do great things and uh, fulfill the mission of your credit union or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, when it comes to the books, I think that there's always nuggets in in all of them that you can take from and push it. I, I would say the most success I've had is because of good leaders. And for me, it's been people who don't, it's not a cookie cutter thing when they're leading. And so they, they look at me and they see what I can do and the capabilities that they, I have, and they help me grow those and they allow me to do the job that I want to do, um, in the way that gets it done for the organization. Plus also gives me satisfaction to be there. And I also need a leader that's going to push me I need, I need a leader that's, and, and everybody's different, right? Some people are, are in a career and they want to be where they're at and they're not looking for the next level. They're happy and others want different. So, so leaders have just got to be aware that everybody's going to be different. And, and, you know, CEO, you don't get to talk to, you, you may get to talk to everybody in the organization, but you don't have direct contact with them. So you got to make sure that you're trading that down to, to the rest of the C-suites and the managers to be able to do the same thing and recognize that, hey, everyone is going to be a little bit different. We all have an end goal. How do you get everybody on the same page to focus on that end goal? Some people might be a, a, you know, a direct line. Others might you know, have a little wiggle while they get there. But as long as we all get there and, and we make it happen, then fantastic. And if everybody's happy while they're doing it, <laughs> uh, score even better. Even better, right? I, I don't know if this is an age thing with me, but like the, that idea of you know being your self and being your authentic self. When I feel people are inauthentic, I, I don't like it, it bothers me more today where I'm just like, that's, that's not you. That's somebody else. So um, anyway, so, that's just random. But now I'm going to jump way back here. But what has y'all most excited about credit unions today? I, I always love to ask that question. And then I, let me put this out there before you answer it. I will link to, to Linda's first time on the show because so much about like innovation and things we talked about on the first show, I think is so important if people haven't heard the, the your, some of your stories. So we will link to that. But today we're sitting in 2023. What has you most excited for credit unions? Can I still say it's technology? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> 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 you have to start linking chat. to your your your, uh, your playlist here with all the element uh, songs that are coming out here the past. Yeah, few years. <laughs> so Chat GPT. You know, I've been playing with it for a while ever ever since it was you know public that just anybody could access it. I've had so much fun with it, and it has obviously it's good and bad. It's scary, but it's also going to be revolutionary not just for credit unions but for life in general. Um, I've used it to craft policies, write business plans, write product descriptions, 
write credit union rap songs <laughs> and put it to actual music finally. Still, I'm excited and also terrified at the same time of AI and its impact on credit unions. And I hope credit unions jump on board fast enough before they're left behind because this is changing everything fast. You were on a, a, a past Minicon panel that I, I got to be the one asking the questions on. And you actually gave an example that I thought was fantastic because we just we hear a lot about like chat GPT and it's like, it's going to do amazing stuff. But like the I feel like sometimes the or it's scary, right? Like, but it's like the examples where you talked about like that idea of somebody asking like, where can I get the best car loan at the that I can be approved for? <laughs> for this right. and it completely takes out all the the marketing side of it because it's like here you go and maybe even fills out the application for you right and gets you pretty approved and i thought that was fantastic because i i was thinking about it afterwards that idea like if the three of us were going to dinner at some place new we probably all know the menu before we get there the, the Actually, same way our food would be ready because <laughs> it would know what we want <laughs> yeah, that, so, so, yeah it's a it's a yeah, fascinating thing a, there's no application. It knows who you are and it's going to offer you whatever. And it's going to know what kind of car I want. Right, exactly. The car. That's which is fantastic. Zach, what has you excited? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for me, it's uh, anything that has potential excites me. And I, I think that there is it, it really feels like with everything going on in the world right now that we're we're kind of at this this tipping point. And I think that credit unions can be the force that is a tipping point towards good. I'm seeing that more are understanding that we have to reimagine, revitalize our, you know, mantra of people helping people. We understand it internally. It means nothing to somebody from Gen Z. All right. You say people helping people and they'll go, which people helping which people and why are the, the people doing this and how are they doing it? And is it sustainable? And is it economically sound? And does it uh, hurt the, the climate or the environment? So there, there's so much more that, that we have the, the possibilities to showcase to the world and this new generation. And I see that's the best part about my job, my day job, uh, working at Mitchell Stankovic and Associates, is that we get to work with different credit unions all across the country and see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And we're seeing more collaboration again, whereas I think we stepped away from that, you know, a few years back and kind of got a little bit more internal and focusing on, on you know, individual credit unions and the, the communities. And because we haven't seen anything like, you know, the financial service centers or, you know, the co-op ATMs, we haven't seen anything grand like that come from the industry in a while. And I think we have the potential to, to make that happen again. I have to give a shout out here, though, to what you y'all are doing over there, like the underground, then to be able to go have the conversations in person, I think are absolutely fantastic. We'll link to those as well. It's it's cool work that is being done. And I think I, I'm just uh, like personally from me that you've executed on that so well. It's amazing. It's a, an amazing community, right? Let me ask you both this. Zach, you just maybe I'll throw it right back to you because it kind of flows into it. What does a career in credit unions look like if we want to not only attract the Gen Z as members and they're asking all those questions? If we want the best of the best to come work for us and we'll come right to you with this as well. And, you know, like if at your credit union, you want to get those smart thinkers, the, the ones who ask a lot of questions and are curious. Like, what does that career have to look like in credit unions? From my standpoint, I think we need to look at the, the industries that are, are pushing and innovating. What are the positions and titles and the types of people that they're hiring? Those are probably the people we need to bring into the credit union movement to take a look and say, hey, this is broken. This is great. This is how we can add on. We need outside perspectives, but we need to be able to have a story to bring people in and say, this is why you want to come to credit unions and, and work for us. But gosh, I'm, I'm forgetting who, who said this. And I think it was Frank Diekman who said, you know, it's great. We go to credit union conferences and it's all credit union people. And we sit there and we pat each other on the back. And we're like, boy, you're doing good. Boy, you're doing good. Boy, we're doing great. And we look and, you know, we're still three years in a row under banks for service. We're still, so we're not doing great. We need some outside perspectives. And I think if we bring people in from other industries to say, hey, we could probably make this work in retail, 
with credit unions or, hey, this is what we're doing in food manufacturing. I wonder if we could take that process and do something different with how you reach out to members. Like, you know, the the sky's the limit. And I think that learning from others is the best way to be innovative and to move forward. Linda? Yeah, and I agree with that because when I came to credit unions, I was an outsider. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, I think I can run a credit union. But I, I took it from a, the outsider perspective. And once I got into it, then it's like, yeah, you get that tunnel vision. So having the fresh voices, fresh faces, fresh positions and evolving and not always having a teller and an MSR and all these traditional things, you have to evolve that because I don't know anybody who says, oh, I want to be a teller. Well, maybe there are a few, but not many. Yeah. So we have to evolve our credit unions to work that people want to do, which right now is helping people through education and an experience, not here's your cash, here's your check. So that's what I think is needed to attract talent. I agree with you. Zach, back to what you were saying, I, that idea of us looking just inside. And one day, you know, you saying you came from the outside, you know, it, that was it's almost been 15 years now. But when we were starting CU Insight, like I wasn't looking at the traditional credit union trade publications. I was looking at what was the Huffington Post doing 15 years ago? What was Mashable doing? You know, like that was because we weren't trying to create the exact same thing that existed already. Right. So anyways, I, I knew this was going to happen that I was going to be crunched for time here. So we st- I still want to have fun with the rapid fire questions here at the end. I, I Because I know both of you, I knew we'd be able to talk for hours and hours, which is fun. But <laughs> So I, I'm going to jump right into these. Like I said before, we will link to absolutely everything in the show notes. But first question to ask is, what did both of you want to be when you were young and growing up? Since we, we know it wasn't necessarily credit unions. And my guess is was Probably wasn't an accountant when you were like a youngster, wasn't Linda? <laughs> oh God, no! If it was, whew. I wanted to be a DJ. I loved music, and I was obsessed with it. And DJ was it. Zach, I was going to be a teacher. I was going to be a teacher. Yep. Oh, now you kind of get to do that through the underground a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when was the last time, either professionally or personally, you were amazed? I'm amazed every day by either technology, by people, experiences, chat GPT. I, you know, I'm going to answer everything with chat GPT. Chat How's, GPT. That? How's that? <laughs> you, you put all these questions into the chat GPT and it just came back yeah. with chat GPT. It'll take care of everything. So, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, professionally, the last time I was amazed was this last GAC and just seeing the the incredible outpouring of support for CU Pride and knowing that that happened in less than three years. So that's amazing to me. That is very amazing. Both of y'all are busy. <laughs> you know, most of us that run in the, the circle that we see each other at these events and things like that, we still have the day jobs back home, right, too. And sometimes that can, you know, I've, I've been asking this question quite a bit here the last couple of years is this idea that when you're trying to change things or trying to build something, you it can get in the way of some time of those personal relationships. I know you both have wonderful spouses and partners and any hacks for the people out there who uh, on, on how to create some of that balance in life. <laughs> Yeah, if you have a flexible schedule, that's what I've done. I'm not a person who wants to work from home 100% or work at the office 100%. So I schedule my work and life balance based upon an energy level and a need for when do I need to be where and doing what. So the actually the pandemic helped me figure that out of what a work-life balance was and now it's like I'm in this great rhythm. Of course, when the time changes, it screws everything up. So please stop changing yeah. <laughs> the time. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's the other thing you got to figure out. But again, it's it's figuring out what works for you and works for your family. So luckily, my wife is retired, so I got wow. Easy Street right now. 
<laughs> I, you know, for me, it's it's really just being first. I, I create the buy-in for what I'm trying to do, and unfortunately for me, my partner Earl, his birthday is June 9th, which happens to fall during Pride Month. And I told him, luckily, I started to you Pride before we met, and I said, I'm very, very sorry, but it's possible that for the rest of my life, your birthday will be mixed with a month-long flurry of activities that I'm doing. So, being upfront and honest with the yeah. things. That going on. And then I too am very lucky and and in the fact that my schedule really goes based upon the work that needs to be done. And so again, with Earl, it's like, hey, this is going to be one of those weeks. So, you know, don't expect me home before this time. And then it's there's other weeks where it's like, hey, I'll be home before you and then let's go do this. So so for for me, it's it's communication and making sure that the work is always fun as well. Because as as long as I'm having a good time at home and at the office, then, then my life is wonderful. Absolutely. For the former wannabe DJ, what's the greatest album of all time? That one you can listen to front to back. And, and Zach, it's coming to you. So, yeah, you better think about this it. This is a terrible question I because know there are many, 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 many of these albums. <laughs> so, I'm just going to go with Kick in Excess, my favorite all time band. Many people won't know it, but I can still listen to that and I can still sing it. Even though I haven't listened to it in years, I'll still know all the lyrics. I just watched a, a documentary on uh, Netflix. There's a documentary out there. So, then that's, uh, not on the album. I should watch it. Yeah. And I just want a, a quick hack for anybody. If anybody says that their favorite brand is NXS, they are 100% Gen X. Um, you know it. It, it, <laughs> it is without fail. Um, oh, and I'm right. I, I love that, Linda. I am actually a journey fan and my my absolute favorite album that I listen to at least once a week is their greatest hits and I just go back and forth I can sing it all we're not going to do that today Randy but um, maybe one of these days I'm, I, I was born and raised in metro Detroit and so I can't hear this without saying there's no such thing as self Detroit just for anybody <laughs> out there, there, there that, that is Windsor Ontario basically so uh, fun little fact for you <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine this question I, 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 I was looking forward to asking both of you this came from chairman harper <laughs> after he was on the show he's like you know what question i'd love who plays you in the movie or biopic of your life yeah this is a bad question too <laughs> <laughs> i'm like hmm i have to remember who actors and actresses are <laughs> um so i picked jodie foster because that's one heck of an actor <laughs> yeah, I think I think she can do anything. So I'm I'm sticking with Jodie Foster. I, I would watch that. <laughs> I have always thought that I was funny, and one time in my life, somebody said that I looked like Vince Vaughn. So that's my answer. That's the easiest one I can give you right now without really internalizing on this question. Uh, I love it. <laughs> that, last question. I hate that we had to skip. Oh wait, no, I want to throw this one out just in case. Is any books out there that you think everybody should read? I, I, I want to add to the book list. So anything you're reading or that favorite of yours? I'm reading something from a local person here in Charleston. Her name is Dr. Michelle Foster, and she is a black Appalachian immigrant from South America. She's been here for a while, but she's a big deal. I mean, I knew she was a big deal, but I didn't know how big of a deal she is. So I just started reading her book. Um, it's called Maximizing Impact, and it's Success Strategies for Dynamic Nonprofits. I don't know enough about it yet because I just started reading it, but she's she's awesome. The topic seems to be on point for our listeners now. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's amazing. I'm, I'm currently reading a book that Sue gave to me called uh, Influence is Your Superpower. And you would think that I would remember who the author is, and I cannot remember. So I'll get it to you, Randy. We can find that. Yeah. I've heard of the book, but I've not read it. So yeah, it's, it's super interesting. I love the style of the writing. And again, you know, when we were talking about books earlier, there's nuggets in it that I love. There's pieces in it that I go, no, nah, okay. But it's really interesting. And again, the, the person that wrote it, I just love her style. So it's great. Awesome. Last question. Final thoughts. Any asks of our listeners before you go? Whatever you do, do it with kindness and love each other. I think I might end everything with that. I think I'm. Get, it's getting old. <laughs> no, I think it's good. I don't think that gets old. <laughs> it never gets old. Mine is find a stranger to talk to, and and always smile when you're out and about because you never know when somebody needs it. 
And mine is going to be, which I normally don't do, but CU Pride membership now open. Link, go to it, link to it, sign up, give money, do it all. Um, <laughs> so I will leave you with that. Uh, if people want more information from both of you, what is your poison? I know we're connected on many channels, but LinkedIn, email, Twitter, what, how can people reach out? Yeah, LinkedIn and email for me are are perfect. Yeah, same here. We will link to your contact information and everything else we talked about today in the show notes. Thank you both again for being here today and doing what you do. A few things before we go. Make sure to check out our friends at Q's in the show notes and learn more about and register for CEO Dialogue and you know become a that part of that conversation. They've been a longtime partner and friend of CUInsight.com in the podcast. I am grateful for their support to allow us to have this much fun doing what we do. So please check them out. Click on their link. Please also subscribe to the see you insight experience on your favorite podcast player we are out there and on them all and if you're looking for a book recommendation like the ones mentioned on the show today a quick google of the see you insight experience podcast book list and your next read can be on its way from amazon last but certainly not least i want to take the time to thank all of you for listening you all rock be well friends and i hope to talk to you soon